Greetings and welcome to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers. I'm here with a very special guest who I really want to take the time to introduce you to, Rob Zins. Rob, great to have you here, brother. Thank you, Larry. Good to be here again yes. with you. Now, a lot of people don't really know who you are, although I know I've known you for decades. But uh, just to let our YouTube viewers out there get a good idea who you are, I'd like you to take some time and explain the books you have written. Now, you are a former Roman Catholic, yet you graduated from Dallas Theological Seminary. Right. In fact, I think your, uh, your degree is in history. Historical True. theology, right. Historical theology. So uh, with that said, and for the sake of our viewers who don't really know who you are, and there's going to be a lot of people like that, <laughs> I'd like you to kind of begin with some of the books you've written, some of the pamphlets, things that talk about your ministry, mm -hmm. maybe your website, and then I'll just throw in my two cents worth whenever I get a chance. Okay. So go ahead. Well, thank you, Larry. It's good to be here. Actually, after graduating from Dallas Seminary, it was my intention to go into the pastoral ministry and to become involved in local church work, which I think is probably what most of the uh, men who graduate from seminary want to do. But having been in the pastoral ministry for several years and, and having uh, come to some uh, idea through my studies about the Great Protestant Reformation, I was concerned a little bit about the uh, disposition of evangelicals toward the Roman Catholic religion. Now, I was raised in the Roman Catholic religion and, and, and went through catechism and confirmation and so forth. But uh, I, I left the Roman Catholic religion and was kind of free-floating and uh, ultimately came to Christ through reading the scriptures and, and having been witnessed to by some Christians uh, a little bit later on in life. And uh, after going to seminary and being a part of the pastoral ministry, I began to notice that there was a shift taking place in our nation that more and more evangelicals, more and more articles and books were written uh, favoring the Roman Catholic religion and sort of building this large tent and including not only Roman Catholicism, but a number of other non-Christian religions under this tent. So I began looking around for books that may address this issue, and there weren't too many books out there. And I came across one book in particular written in the early 50s by a man named Lorraine Bettner. And at that time, Dr. Bettner had written a standard work on the Roman Catholic religion, but it was outdated. And along about that same time, a Roman Catholic writer wrote a book, an apologetic book, wherein he set about to do what uh, the book says debunk Lorraine Bettner. In other words, to disprove all that Lorraine Bettner was saying about the Roman Catholic religion. You're so, talking about Carl Keating? Carl Keating, right. Mm -hmm. Carl Keating's book. So I read Keating's book uh, and, and read Bettner's book again. And I, I asked the question almost out loud, has anybody answered Keating? Now, he started Catholic Answers. He did. He started Catholic Answers in San Diego, and no one at that time had given a direct answer to Carl Keating. So I decided, well, let's give it a try. And that's when I wrote my, uh, my very first book, and this book is entitled Romanism, The Relentless Roman Catholic Assault on the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, it's a long title, Romanism, The Relentless Roman Catholic Assault on the Gospel of Jesus Christ, but it's a purposeful title. This book goes through every single chapter of Carl Keating's work and analyzes the Roman Catholic position on virtually every aspect of their religion. We have in this book a chapter on... Baptism, penance, purgatory, the Eucharist, the Mass, the place of Peter invoking the dead, Mary, justification, the so-called charge of professional anti-Catholics, and a final chapter on the changing face of Rome due to Vatican II. So this book was written in response to a very strong Roman Catholic writer, mm -hmm. and that actually began the ball rolling to have a, a more full-orbed, ongoing ministry to the Roman Catholic community. Mm -hmm. But, as you know, in 1994, a statement came out called ECT, Evangelicals and Catholics Together, where a number of prominent evangelicals actually signed a document essentially endorsing the Roman Catholic religion. This document came as quite a shock to the evangelical community. It still has a rippling effect to our day, 
And I think I, it was signed by like Bill Bright of Bill Bright, Campus Crusade, uh, J.I. Packer, J. I. Packer um, uh, a number of people. And that led me to write my second book. My second book is entitled On the Edge of Apostasy, subtitled The Evangelical Romance with Rome. This book is extremely important because we analyze the modern evangelical thought patterns mm -hmm. of those who would want to convince us that the Roman Catholic religion is just another branch or form of Christianity. And uh, did a lot of research, it's well footnoted, and uh, I, I just spent a lot of time trying to answer the question, why would evangelicals ever think that the Roman Catholic religion is in fact a Christian religion and should be considered as an alternative worshiping community to Christianity? And having written this book, I got into all kinds of trouble because uh, it flies in the face of the modern uh, thinking mm -hmm. of ecumenism. So this deals with the ecumenical movement and a number of broad organizations. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have it available for you on a number of okay, various where, websites. Uh, could you briefly yeah. mention a few of your other references before we... Yes, we realize that a lot of people don't like to read long books, so we've written <laughs> short books. And this booklet right here is a, a book that we've sent all over the world. It's entitled Salvation by Grace Through Faith Alone or by Grace Through Sacraments. And this is a very uh, concise analysis of the Roman Catholic sacramental system. And it's not too hard to read, it's not too long, it's direct, and we think we hit the point very well. But for those who like to read booklets, <laughs> we have written a tiny little booklet that we do send out a lot. It's called, I'm a Christian, you are a Roman Catholic, so what is the big deal? And this also has been translated into Spanish as well. And uh, I like to remind you that uh, we do send these booklets over to Spanish-speaking nations and people. In fact, we made, a, we made a Spanish video yeah. out of that, and it is yeah, on it. YouTube. Yeah, it the, is on the YouTube. audio is on YouTube. Right. So between the, the larger works, the medium works, and the smaller works, this is a sampling of the kinds of things that we use uh, to help Roman Catholics understand their own religion and also to help evangelicals understand the Roman Catholic religion and in doing so I think you'll you'll have to agree at the end of the day that the Roman Catholic religion is a religion unto itself and uh, uses in some cases many Christian terms but defines them with a completely non-Christian dictionary that's the way well, I like to say it. I would like to mention also that uh, for those of you out there that uh, may not be familiar with our, uh, uh, our YouTube channel page See Answers TV you're seeing it right now on your screen, but uh, you may not have noticed that if you look at our channel page and you go down a little bit, on the page you'll find that we list several websites, BibleQuery.org, MuslimHope.com, uh, HistoryCart.com, BereanBeacon.org, PilgrimPublications.com, and then there's one right under after that called CWRC-RZ.org. Now, does that sound familiar to you? Rough. It certainly does. That's our website, uh, Larry, cwrc-rz.org. And if you come to our website and scroll through it, there are tons of articles and information on how you can get these books and pamphlets, and we'd uh, love to hear from you. You can email me and uh, order anything you want off the website. Yeah, I'd also like to mention to our viewers that if you're on our channel page, you'll notice we have 19 playlists that go down the right-hand side of the page on all kinds of subjects. Third one down is on Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons and, and uh, Seventh-day Adventists and so forth. But as you get way down in there, you, you find Roman Catholicism. You're seeing on the screen, this is our playlist on Roman Catholicism. At the time we did this video, it was we had 79 videos. We've got more now But uh, by the time you're seeing this. But uh, as you're looking at this, uh, you see that we have... Uh, all these videos, and Rob is in quite a few of these videos. Mm. Rob, as the people are looking at this, they, they see here that uh, there's a Boston College debate. And what happened in that particular video, for instance? Well, the Boston College debate was a, a debate that uh, centered around the authority of the Pope at Rome. Essentially, it was our duty and, and privilege to debate two Roman Catholic scholars on stage at Boston College, and they presented the Roman Catholic uh, persuasion on the Pope at Rome, who's considered in their religion to be the vicar of Christ on earth, and 
we did everything we could to refute their understanding and also to present the, the biblical Christian understanding of the person of Peter. So that, that's the, the very kind of thing that we do, and we have it on videotape. And anybody who's interested in the difference between what a Roman Catholic scholar would present about their own religion and about the Pope at Rome, and the contrasting view, the antithetical view, actually the opposite view of biblical Christianity, that would be a good debate to watch. Right, and I wanted to mention on our playlist, we have our 16-hour video series with Rob and me that we did like 20 years ago. Right. Uh, but that covers uh, the, the whole orb of all the teachings and doctrines of the Roman Catholic religion. And then we've got all kinds of other videos that Rob and me have done as well. Your debate with the Monsignor, right. for instance, that was most interesting. He was basically saying you can believe anything yeah. and it doesn't really matter. I'm letting uh, everyone know that we have many, many videos. One last thing I want to say is if you type Rob Zins, that's R-O-B-Z-I-N-S, into the YouTube search box, you'll get a whole plethora of Rob Zins videos that are available on YouTube. And if you were to type Rob Zins Romanism, once again, you'll get even more Rob Zins videos <laughs> in a plethora of uh, videos available. And as you can see these things, there's just some samples there on your screen. But uh, with that said, we just wanted to call your attention to all the resources that are available through this brother in Christ here, former Roman Catholic, who was saved by a supernatural act of God. That's really the difference in a real Christian who has been born again, John 3, 3 through 8, through a work of the, the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit over just getting baptized or, or doing all these sacraments or things of that nature. We're talking about what makes you a real Christian is a supernatural act of God on your behalf where before you were dead in your sins and trespasses. Yeah. Behold, now you're alive in Christ. And that's really what changed your life. Amen. All right, brother, with that said, uh, we're going to go into, this is just a promo leading into a main video. So uh, thank you for joining us for this uh, little information uh, situation for discussing Rob. And I uh, hope you enjoy the video to come. God bless you all. Adam was a super being when God created him. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether people even know this, but he was the first superman that really ever lived. <laughs> first of all, the scriptures declare clearly that he had dominion over the fowls of the air, the fish of the sea, which mm -hmm. means he used to fly. Whoa. Well, of course, how can you have dominion over the birds and not be able to do what they do? Whoa. <laughs> Actually, I mean, the, wait a minute. I, Wait I'll prove it to you. Wait a minute, <laughs> Danny. I've never heard that. The word dominion yes. in the Hebrew clearly declares that if you have dominion over a subject, that you do everything that subject does. In other words, that subject, if it does something you, you cannot do, you don't have dominion over it. I'll prove it further. Adam not only flew, he flew to space. He used to be 
he 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 was with one thought he'd be on the moon ladies and gentlemen are you here to learn and you sit there and don't think about your chicken and about your roast and about your spaghetti anything else put it all out of the way right now this is life to us god the father ladies and gentlemen is a person and he is a triune being by himself separate from the son and the holy ghost so what did you say hear it hear it hear it see god the father is a person god the son is a person god the holy ghost is a person but each one of them is a triune being by himself if i can shock you and maybe i should there's nine of them <gasps> what did you say let me explain god the father ladies and gentlemen is a person with his own personal spirit with his own personal soul and his own personal spirit body he said oh, i never heard that but you think you're in the church to hear things you heard for the last 50 years faith didn't come billowing out of some giant monster somewhere it came out of the heart of a being that is very uncanny the way he's very much like you and me a being that stands somewhere around 6263 that weighs somewhere in the neighborhood of a couple of hundred pounds a little better has a span of eight and i mean nine inches across stood up and said light be and this universe situated itself and went into motion glory to god hallelujah god's reason for creating adam was his desire to reproduce himself i mean a reproduction of himself and in the garden of eden he did that he was not a little like god he was not almost like god he was not uh, subordinate to god even and adam is as much like god as you could get just the same as jesus when he came into the earth he said if you've seen me you've seen the father he wasn't a lot like god he's god manifested in the flesh and i want you to know something adam in the garden of eden was god manifested in the flesh god the father cannot do anything in this earth realm without permission Jeremiah, prophet of Israel, had this to say about the false prophets who were leading his people astray. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Wherefore their way shall be unto them as slippery ways in the darkness. They shall be driven on and fall therein, for I will bring evil upon them, even the year of their visitation saith the Lord. They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. They say still unto them that despise me, the Lord hath said, he shall have peace. And they say unto everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come upon you. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. I have heard what the prophet said, that prophecy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets 
of the deceit of their own heart, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor, as their fathers have forgotten me, my name for Baal. The prophet that has a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words every one from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, he saith. Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. For ye have perverted the words of the living God, of the Lord, of host, our God. Therefore, behold, I, even I, will utterly forget you, and I will forsake you in the city that I gave you and your fathers, and cast you out of my presence. And I will bring an everlasting reproach upon you, and a perpetual shame, which shall not be forgotten. Greetings and welcome once again to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, your host, and I want to thank you for being here for another episode of Christian Answers Presents. I'm uh, the director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian Debater Ministry, and I'm here in studio with a very special guest and a good friend of mine, Rob Zins. Rob, great to have you here, brother. Thank you. Uh, good to be here. Yes. As we begin this video, I thought it would be interesting to let our viewers see something I got in the mail personally. You can see here it says, join us for Easter. It says, casual dress, practical teaching, rockin' music, vineyard kids, church that's actually fun. So as we look at this Easter mailing, I mean, this came to my house uh, the week before we were getting ready to do this video, uh, show number four of our series. And uh, I thought, well, you know, what the timing is impeccable. And as uh, you can see on the back side of this flyer that where they're inviting me to go to their church to go have fun, it uh, says they're going to have uh, a playscape there, as you can see, for Vineyard Kids, a grand opening of a new playground, and underneath it, Epic Entertainment on Easter, Sunday, April the 5th, Hamster Ball Races, Hilarious Mascot Skits, Toilet paper guns, Easter goodie bags for all children. Wow, man, that sounds like we're having a real circus like atmosphere here for uh, the Easter services. Now, this particular uh, church is associated with the, the vineyard churches, and I happen to go to Wikipedia to look up with something on them, and you can see it there on your screen. It says Association of Vineyard Churches. Uh, this is from Wikipedia, as I said. The Association of Vineyard Churches, also known as the Vineyard Movement, is a neo-charismatic evangelical Christian denomination with over 1,500 affiliated churches worldwide. The Vineyard Movement is rooted in a charismatic renewal in historic evangelicalism. Instead of the mainstream charismatic label, however, the movement has preferred the term empowered evangelicals, a term coined by Rich Nathan and Ken Wilson in their book of the same name to reflect their roots in traditional evangelicalism as opposed to classic Pentecostalism. Members also sometimes describe themselves as the radical middle between evangelicals and Pentecostals, which is a reference to the book the Quest for the Radical Middle, a historical survey of the vineyard by Bill Jackson. It has been associated with the Signs and Wonders movement, the Toronto Blessing, the Kansas City Prophets, and a particular style of Christian worship music. 
As you can see, it's associated with the Signs and Wonders movement, the Toronto Blessing, the Kansas City Prophets, and a particular style of Christian worship music. Now, what we can see here is they want to be considered the radical middle, but really... That distinction is simply to try to distance themselves from all their delusional, charismatic, and Pentecostal brothers that are out there as we're documenting this video series. So therefore, you can try to distance yourself, but it's not really going to do any good when uh, at the same time you're still practicing all the signs and wonders. And as this series will continue on, we'll get into the Kansas City Prophets uh, the Toronto Blessing, things of that nature, maybe not in this particular episode, but we'll show how the mad delusions of this movement are inherent there. So that's something you have to be careful about with uh, groups out there. When they get to where they're distinctive enough where people can tell that something's strange or different about them, they try to distance themselves from that label so they can still sneak under the table, you might say, and get away with whatever they're trying to do. But uh, as you see here, here's what you can look forward to when it comes to an Easter service at their church. I don't, I don't know, but maybe your church service doesn't have hilarious mascot skits and toilet paper guns. But uh, anyway, this is just more of the same kind of strange, charismatic, and Pentecostal mayhem that's taking place around the world today. But we're going to find out that the reason people weren't exercised of demons or, or something else, it wasn't the faith of the person because most of the people getting healed in the Bible had no faith. Right. You got those 10 lepers. Right. Only one right. of the 10 came. And a lot of them didn't even know who he was. <laughs> and they had no faith to begin with. And some of these people were dead. The right. little girl. Right. How is she going to have any faith? She's raised from the dead by Jesus. She's right. dead. Yeah. How do, you, how do you have faith when you're dead? Uh, you yeah, know, if only Lazarus, she had more faith. Yeah, only Lazarus yeah had but more see, faith. these false prophets don't tell you any of those kind of miracles right. and healings. They, they want you to think, oh, it's you. You don't have enough faith. Right. But, but the scripture says in these miraculous miracles and raising from the dead, they, it did, faith was not required because the faith was on the one doing the miracles. The Jesus condemned his own disciples for not having enough faith when it came to not casting that demon out. Right. A, see, the healer is the one who has the faith, so, not, the, not so, the ones receiving. So what, what you're saying, saying if, if Copeland and Hen and their ilk, if they had more faith, everybody would be they, healed and raised from the dead. Put it on them. Put it <laughs> but on see, them. See, they don't tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. They, see, that's the trick. It's like when they're saying, give, give me $1,000, so like Robert Tilton or something, mm -hmm. give me a, a $1,000 so God will give you 10000 You know, God will bless you by you giving me the seed faith, like Oral Roberts would say, or any of these guys. Uh, give me that money, and then God will give you all these blessings. But see, if they took that to its logical conclusion, and you get 10 times what you give, well, then why doesn't Oral Roberts give you $1,000? Or Benny Hinn give you five thousand dollars, or Robert Tilton give you ten thousand dollars. They'd be so blessed he, a lot faster, wouldn't they? See, so that way God could give them all this money for giving you money. Right. See, but no one thinks about that either, do no, they? No, uh, no. Well, That's, well, anyway, let's no. uh, let's let's move along here. Uh, okay. I, I mentioned I promised to our viewers in show number one I'd come back to this book that mm -hmm. Walter Martin of the Christian Research Institute had recommended that I, I was about to join this Pentecostal church. Right. I was on fire for God because I enjoyed the circus. I didn't realize it at the time, but the strobe lights, the rock right. bands, everybody speaking in tongues all at the same time in, in the church uh, and all this stuff. I got excited. I was you know, a newborn Christian, not knowing any better. I wanted to join the church. I'm going to get baptized in Jesus' name. But when he said that, I got really disturbed by that. Mm -hmm. Went down to the Christian bookstore and because uh, Walter Martin had recommended this book. And so I started reading up from what I could find out about this charismatic stuff. Right. Because, because this is all new to me. It's like, wait a minute, what's going on here with this? And as the viewers can see from home, I'll take you through a few pages of this, which I thought were very enlightening in my case, because basically what happened, is, and I also got some books on the, the, the biblical, biblical doctrine of the Trinity. Mm -hmm. And, and 
in, in relation to what this guy is telling me about Acts 2.38 and being baptized in the name of Jesus only because it turns out this was a oneness Pentecostal mm -hmm. heretical movement mm -hmm. uh, that I had walked into by, you know, by ignorance. Uh, and uh, so I found out that they were doctrinally wrong on that point. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you don't know the true nature of God, biblically, you don't know God. <laughs> <laughs> it's a different uh, God. Uh, yeah, it's a different God, and that's what the oneness Pentecostals have. Uh, but yet they claim to have the Holy Spirit and all this kind of stuff like we know that goes on in charismatic and Pentecostal movements. But right. anyway, as I'm, I'm looking at uh, this book that was recommended by Walter Martin, and it's interesting about Kirk Koch because uh, as I, I looked around in here, uh, I noticed that he, he did believe in charismatic gifts because there's... There's groups out there known as continuationists. Right. And uh, there's, there's a lot of good Christians that we wouldn't put in the same class as the kind of Charismatics and Pentecostals, uh, but they're not like them at the same time. Right. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I know one former Assembly of God preacher, uh, Jackson Boyette, you're, you're familiar with him. Right. Mm -hmm. he, he was a continuationist because he still had some vestiges of that Assemblies of God thing because he believed he could speak in tongues in his private paraclosm. Right. Now, uh, I knew him for over 30 years, and in all the church services and everything, I was associated with him, and none of this charismatic stuff ever came up right. during the church service at all. But he still believed he could speak in tongues when he was praying privately to God away from everybody. Right. So it was like it never was even a factor. Yeah, you know, yeah. And I, I think you do. I th you bring up a very good point here. There are non cessationists who, frankly, wrestle with the same kinds of things that we do when we come to the text. And I want the audience to know that we are in the text. We are familiar with Acts chapter 2, we are familiar with Acts chapter 10, we are familiar with 1 Corinthians. 11 through 14. We understand that the word apostle has two meanings in the New Testament. One as a distinguished use for a select group chosen by Christ to bear authority in the early church. We do not believe that that particular office gift continues on throughout the rest of the church age once the last apostle chosen personally by Christ and the criteria is set forth in the New Testament for an apostolic apostle with that kind of authority. We don't believe that that continues. But we do believe that the term apostle is used in a more pedestrian sense for one who is sent, one who is sent with a message, and therefore there, this term can be used in a non-technical sense of somebody who has a message. We understand this. We also understand the tremendous tension that exists between known languages in Acts chapter 2 and the so-called heavenly language, private speaking in tongues, that seems to be given to the church, seems to be a part of the local assembly of believers uh, as part of the gifting in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And uh, actually the attention begins in Acts chapter 10. We are aware of these things. What we are talking about in these videos and, and, and our condemnation of this, we're talking about the false prophets who call themselves prophets, the, the organization of religious um, zealots who take upon themselves the office of a New Testament prophet or a New Testament apostle and use that kind of authority, wield it in their assembly, and dupe their people into believing that they are some kind of supernatural representative of God here on earth. And, and the dead also, giveaway is they violate the Word of God. And they violate the Word of God. So I'm glad you brought that up because who hasn't wrestled with this whole idea of which gifts are valid in the body of Christ today and which gifts have fallen off uh, into antiquity, no longer necessary for the body of Christ. We all do, but we are talking about these vain and imagined uh, purveyors of these false gospels and 
taken upon themselves the worst sort of identity uh, disguising themselves as true apostles when really they and are. And as, well, as, as you know as well as I do, and we'll get to this in a series, but uh, John MacArthur's book, Strange Fire, right. he documents in there how uh, it used to be said that what we're talking about in this charismatic stuff was on the French. Right. But as he documents, and we're going to talk about later, uh, it's not the French anymore. Right. I mean, they, that is the majority. And he says up to 90% of them in mm -hmm. a lot of these third world countries are mm -hmm. buying in, into all this craziness, this yeah. circus religion yeah. that we've been discussing, 90% in a lot of these third world countries. Yeah. And so it's the majority view now of yeah. Pentecostals and Charismatics, yeah. which also comprise oneness Pentecostals, Mormons, mm -hmm. and Charismatic Roman Catholics. Yeah, the, the whole so, thing is completely out of hand. Right. And, and, the, and the poor guy that's... Uh, Maybe like Jackson Boyot, thinking maybe I can pray in a tongue to my Lord in my closet prayer, thinking maybe he has given me this special little gift of speaking in tongues. Uh -huh. Man, he's got he's to go undercover. He's got to head for the hills because <laughs> the minute he says, I do that. We had a couple in our fellowship when I was pastoring in Vermont, and they came to me and said, you know, we... We, we just believe that the Bible teaches that there is this heavenly language that we can Speaking speak to the tongues. Lord and pray with mm -hmm. our spirit and so forth. They quoted all the verses, and, and I said, so well, what's the matter with it? And said, so, well, if we ever said that we were, it, it'd be like identifying with all these monsters out there. See, that's why and they I call said, themselves continuations. Yeah, they're trying yeah. to use that word now so they're not associated with yeah. Charismatics yeah. or Pentecostals. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah they, 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 uh, they have a valid point. I, and when I was pastoring this particular church, and I, I said, look, uh, I read 1 Corinthians 14 thoroughly. We've studied it together in here as a group and also individually. And you know if it's good for the body of Christ, we all want it. But you also know the restrictions and the stipulations, and you just can't come in here and start speaking in some kind of gibberish and claim that it's come from God. The Apostle Paul outlines it very carefully. If there is extant this kind of gift to the body of Christ, it is regulated. Yes. And boy, did I pronounce that strongly. Yes. Regulated by the scriptures. If anyone speaks and, in tongues, there must be an interpreter. Right. And there, it's done in order, no more than three. Right. And he's saying this at the time when the gifts of the Spirit were in force right. in the early church yes. at that time. Yes. You know, so yes. it's obvious. But that didn't mean that he's talking about 2,000 years later yeah. when you don't need that association because you've got the Word of God you've got and the, the illumination of, of the Holy Spirit within our spirits. And that, and that is the, the argument against that. The cessationist would say it's not necessary and it's not worth the trouble, frankly, because... You come in here and you say you've got the gift of prophesying. And, and, if, and if Benny Hinn came in and said, I'm a prophet, I've got the gift of prophecy, right. I'm going to stand up and tell you, I'm going to regulate him right out of 1 Corinthians That's 14. Right. That's and right. say, when you speak, you're going to be regulated. You're going to be regulated by the Word of God. You're going to be regulated by others who proclaim the Word of God. Mm -hmm. And we're going to just see if what you say is the truth. Mm -hmm. So... Scripture trumps the gift. That's right. Always. But these charismatics and Pentecostals don't want it that way. No. They no. don't, and they don't they, want it that way. They're out of control. Exactly. And, and that reminds me when I was, before I read some more out of Kurt Koch's book here, I haven't read any yet, but uh, when I was in that church, everybody was speaking in tongues at the same time. Yeah. I didn't know any better at the time, but after I read 1 Corinthians 14, I think it was, yeah. you know, and about the, you know, if anyone speaks in tongues, you got to have an interpreter and right. all this. And I'm going, then, and then it, he, Paul talks about, you know, if someone comes in here, they're going to think you're madmen, right. you know, if you walk in here, you know, if you're like, and I'm going, these people are violating, and, that, and now it's just a newborn yeah, Christian. You can and see And I clearly. found that out way, yeah. back when I was only, you know, a week or two old in the Lord. Right. I learned from 1 Corinthians, these guys aren't even following what the they're Apostle Paul. They're not even close. I know. They're violating yeah. what the Word of God says. Yeah. I learned that just starting out. Yeah. So <laughs> in, in essence, they have destroyed any hope of that gift being beneficial to the body of Christ. That's right. They have destroyed it. That's right. And here's another thing we have to consider. Supposing in the first century or second century, 
the body of Corinth is meeting at Corinth, and, and, and the guy stands up and he starts speaking in tongues. And everybody says, that's fine. We know, we know this guy. He's a good guy. And, and he's speaking in this heavenly language. And besides, we've got an interpreter right here. He'll set us straight. So the interpreter stands up and he says something. And everybody goes, eh, you know. <laughs> eh. <laughs> Gosh, are you sure? That's what he meant. <laughs> are you sure that Adam could fly? <laughs> And he could just give a thought and be on the moon. That's what he said. And, 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 the, and the interpreter says, hey, I'm just the interpreter. All right? Mm -hmm. That's what he said. Uh, and so the prophets are going to stand up and say, that's bogus. Uh -huh. uh, that, either you're a phony interpreter or you're a phony tongue guy. Mm -hmm. and, and how are we going to check it all out? The, what does it come back to? The word what of God. saith the word of God. Exactly. And in fact, uh, it reminds me of another time in this one this Pentecostal church I almost joined until the spirit and study and the word of God got me away from that. Uh, yeah. It was this one guy said he had been healed at one of their healing services on Wednesday because I went back the second time, you know, I was talking yeah. to some of the people. And he said that he was born with one leg longer than the other leg. And so he l walked with a limp because uh -huh. he had a long leg and a short leg. Uh -huh. And... Uh, so at the healing service, this, one of this Pentecostal healing service, uh, he's telling me how he was healed there. And then a couple of other ones, yeah, he was healed. He was healed. The preacher laid hands on him and you know, pronounced in a, you know, by the power of the Spirit that he was healed. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he told me about how his leg, other got, leg got lengthened. So the Lord in this miracle healing had lengthened his other leg to the same size as the other leg. Mm -hmm. So now he's perfect. And, and so after he told me all this, he walked away. And he had the biggest limp you ever saw. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I'm looking at that and I go, wait a minute, he just told me and these other people verified he was healed. And then one of them, one of them that was still there after he was walking away, limping like crazy, uh, said, oh, well, he just has, a, he has to claim that. You know, he, uh, as he ah, claims that, he'll eventually have the, but he's healed. He just hasn't claimed it for himself yet, you know, but he's healed and he knows he's healed. And, and I'm sitting there going, these guys are nuts. I'm thinking in my mind, yeah. I didn't tell them that. I just yeah. said, these guys are nuts. Yeah. Well, where are you going to go with that? <laughs> where, 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 where do we go with that? And, I mean, I, just, and I'm a newborn Christian. Yeah. I'm a newborn Christian with the spirit. And I'm already figuring this stuff out right there in the middle of it. You know, yeah. I'm figuring that out yeah. just from right off the bat just read the word <laughs> i mean when the apostle says i'd rather speak five words with my mind than five thousand exactly. with the tongue that's it case closed that's done right. get out of here that's right it's over just shut yeah. up listen to the apostle yeah. what are you selling me and it is the show <laughs> that's it, it is the circus. that's why i wanted to join i think yeah. back to it now and i just go i just love the show yeah. You know, the guy preaching, he's sweating like Louis Armstrong. And yeah. all that. Well, anyway, let me read you some of this stuff from Kurt Koch, finally, from, uh, on Walter Martin's recommendation. Right here on page 27, as you can see it on your screen, the Holy Spirit and alien spirits. The late Friedrich Heitmuller, the head of the Holstein Wall Congregation in Hamburg, apparently this is in Germany, uh, coined the term hybrid spirits. This expression can be taken in two ways, one wrong and the other right. It would be wrong to suppose that the Holy Spirit could dwell together with demonic spirits in a man. That is impossible. And Heitmuller did not mean it that way. This expression means rather that alien spirits, frequently from the very lowest depths, give themselves out to be the Holy Spirit. Here we encounter once more the words of Scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, and you quoted it earlier. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. End quote. There are classic examples how unholy spirits can turn up in biblical disguise and lead men astray. I will mention a few. Among those whose language is German, the books of Jacob Lawyer, 1800 to 1864, has spread much confusion. Lorber, a native of Austria, was not only a mystic, but also a spiritist medium. He wrote the so-called Great Gospel of John and the Son of the Spirit. In my pastoral work, I have become familiar with the devastating effects of this 
devout spiritualist. In the English-speaking world, the best known of these hybrid spirits is probably Harry Edwards. He too is a spiritualist medium. He wrote the book, Spiritual Healing. Edwards speaks of heavenly gods, his angels, without whom he could do nothing. What is seductive about him is the way he cloaks his demonic effects in a robe of Christian piety so that even many Christians and Anglican clergy go to him for advice and assistance. In America, Edward Casey deserves mention. In his theories, he resembles Jacob Loiber. Like Lorber, for example, he espouses reincarnation and asserts, like Lorber, that his powers and spiritual insights are of divine origin. In the French-speaking world, I will single out a Catholic book that is presently receiving great attention and publicity among devout Catholics. I must here discuss this book briefly, although this means I must uh, uh, disillusion my Catholic friends. The book is entitled The Message of Gracious Love Addressed to Lowly Souls. The author is known only by her name Marguerite. Within the compass of its 500 pages, the book contains alongside some promising statements a wealth of fantastic notions, if not out-and-out -out devout spiritualism. The contents consists of more than a thousand conversations between Jesus or his mother Mary or Marguerite. Devout, cast, but devout Catholics actually believe that in these pages, Jesus is speaking directly to Marguerite. It is easy to demonstrate the contrary. We read, for example, on page 51 that Jesus entrusts Marguerite with the following commission, quote, I wish for a worldwide day of prayer and worship and reparation for sins and for the peace of the world, end quote. Now, very much like Marian apparitions, very much there like you go. Marian apparitions. And uh, as he gets into page 45 and 46, and you'll, you see that on your screen with uh, page 45 and on to 40, 46, the uh, Tayama incident was a spiritual catastrophe for missionary work. I have used this example several times to document my position. Members of Pentecostal sects have replied by citing Luke chapter 11, verses 11 through 13, quote, If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent, end quote. Those who spoke in tongues interpreted this saying to mean, quote, we prayed that God would give us the gift of tongues, and so he does not give us a serpent, end quote. There are two errors in this kind of biblical interpretation. In the first place, the Holy Spirit cannot be coerced and told what he is to do. Lukewarmness can grieve the spirit, but so can legalistic coercion. And Rob, you were talking about that earlier with right. the Holy, the, the Roman Catholic, not Holy Roman Catholic, mm -hmm. but, but Roman Catholic doctrine. On the other hand, the Holy Spirit uh, does not confess false doctrine. The theology of the Pentecostal churches falls short at several points. The Holy Spirit confesses only the teaching of the Bible, not human invention. Therefore, the response to coercive prayer can easily be a serpent instead of a fish. A historical example can support the statement. In 1900, when news of the Glossolalia revival came to Europe, the, the Norwegian evangelist uh, Barrett went to Los Angeles. For 39 days, he spent several hours in prayer each day, praying for the gift of tongues. Finally, he extended his praying to 12 hours without interruption. Then finally it came. Round uh, about him, people were falling down in ecstasy, as I experienced in Haiti. Barrett was infected by the Spirit and began to pray in tongues. This achievement he then brought back to Scandinavia. Uh, from there, this fanatical movement came to Germany. As you see here from page 46, it says, When our missionaries returned, they reported, the man from California spoke, sang, and prayed in tongues for an hour and a half. No interpreter was present. No one knew what he actually said. After the meeting, one of our missionaries went to the pastor 
and asked him how to receive the gift of tongues. The Californian gave him the following instructions. Quote, say a short prayer like, Lord, help me, end quote, five to 800 times. Then your tongue will be used to it and you will automatically begin to speak in tongues. This is supposed to be the work of the Holy Spirit. It is a way of training the unconscious to produce glossolalia on human terms. I even consider it blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Titusville, Florida. Invited by Reverend Peter Lord, I had some meetings in the wonderful Park Avenue Church. One of the assistant ministers informed me about a lighted sign in front of a church with the words, we teach tongue speaking. And this will be a gift of the Holy Spirit. This is sheer blasphemy. Mm. Okay, now here's another story from page 123. A missionary from Africa was spending his furlough in Europe. He was visiting the prayer meeting of a Pentecostal church when suddenly he heard a prayer in the African dialect that he himself knew. The prayer consisted of all kinds of blasphemies against the Holy Trinity. The missionary left the room so as not to share responsibility for the offense. He waited outside until the meeting was over and told the astonished speaker what he had been praying. Here we are not dealing with interpretation through a gift of the Holy Spirit, but rather with interpretation through knowledge of a studied language. It is therefore not an example of the gift of interpretation. A different experience casts no more light on this problem. A converted Jewish Christian was praying the first Psalm in Hebrew. Another participant who did not know any Hebrew stood up and gave the interpretation. <laughs> the, the Hebrewist was shocked. He told the interpreter, your interpretation was wrong. It was Psalm 1 in the original language of the Bible. With respect to interpretation, I am groping in the dark. I myself have never had this gift, nor have I been able to substantiate the accuracy of any interpretations. The fact remains that there is a gift of interpretation which was certainly abundantly present in the apostolic age, but has now gone into a marked eclipse. Interpretation is only a supplementary gift to the gift of tongues. Now he's got a whole book of examples of all these things, people speaking in tongues, unaware to them, they're speaking blasphemies. Another guy speaking the Psalm, Psalm 1 in Hebrew, actual mm -hmm. Hebrew. Some other guy gets up and gives an interpretation that is totally foreign to what he just said in right. Hebrew. Right. And you got guys putting up signs in front of churches saying, we teach, we teach tongues here. And uh, at this point, I want you to see, see a video of uh, Sid Roth, a charismatic teacher. And he's showing you how to speak in tongues. Mm. So watch this clip. And if you've never prayed in tongues, if you follow my instructions, the anointing is here to do the rest. I can't do it for you, but I can tell you how to pray in supernatural languages. So you start speaking like little baby words and say them as fast as you humanly can when I begin to pray. And when the supernatural will become natural as you take a step, Peter, of faith. Raise your hands to the Holy God and begin to pray in a language you've never been instructed. If you don't move your tongue and speak, no one else will do it. In the
I know you don't know what to say. Make little nonsense syllables up there, not nonsense. But if the first words coming out of your spirit, do it faster. I said faster. I said faster. I said faster. You can do it faster than that. If I had a gun in your room to do it faster. Deaf ears are being opened yes. right now yes. in we Jesus' agree. name. Backs are being healed. Wrist, in the name of Jesus. tunnel, you're healed. In the Fingers, name of Jesus. in Jesus' name, right now. In the name I'll of Jesus, it. hallelujah. This is normal. <laughs> Let the whole world be it normal. Is, it is. And I can give you a list. Uh, faith has been supplanted by reason. Today, we don't do anything unless we understand it. When the, if you go to the scripture, every act of miracle of God, it cannot be explained. That's what supernatural means. Something that cannot be explained is beyond your head, is beyond your reason. If you want to receive your miracle now, you need to disconnect your head. <laughs> and your reason has its place. I'm not saying you're stupid, that we have to be stupid. That's not what I'm saying. But you can't get into the supernatural. You cannot move in the supernatural by, by the reason. So, Ron, what do you think about what you just saw there from Sid Roth? Well, it reminds me of a story that my wife told me when she was living in Rhode Island before we got married. She went to a church, and some guy came up to her and said, do you want to speak in tongues? And she said, I don't know. Do I need to speak in tongues? He said, well, yeah, you need to have the blessing of the Holy Spirit. She said, well, I, I've never spoken in tongues. Would you like to learn how? And she said, how? And he said, well, we can get you started. We can get you started on this. And so evidently she went up to the altar and the guy said, now I want you to just start wagging your tongue back and forth and, and start saying things like la, 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 just to get the, just to get the idea and just to get the movement and just to, to start making baby steps and speaking in tongues. And she said, I got to get out of here. And thankfully she said, I'm gone. I'm not, this is crazy. She had read enough of the scripture to know mm -hmm. that speaking in tongues, if it is valid, if it is still for the church, for the edification of the body of Christ, mm -hmm. it comes from the Holy Spirit, not from mm -hmm. some guy up there trying to teach you how to wag and, your and, tongue. And notice speaking in tongues in the Bible, in the apostolic age, when you're reading about it in the Word of God, right. it's always a valid real language. It's an actual language that people understand and speak you got the up uh, the acts chapter two uh you know all these people on the day yeah. of pentecost they're hearing languages in their own thing yeah. and then when paul refers to it in, in corinthians mm -hmm. he says well if someone gets up to speak in tongues you have to have an interpreter over here so and when you look at the greek and we'll get into some of this later but uh the greek it makes it clear it's a dialect luke makes it obvious it's not an, a gibberish Mm -hmm. or something that's not a real language. It's an actual language, mm -hmm. which can be given, even though the person themselves may not know what they're saying, but the interpreter could interpret that through that power that we're reading about in the Bible. That's all I'm saying about it. Yeah. But the kind of stuff they're talking about, like Nancy experience, mm -hmm. that has nothing to do with a real language at all. And, and so it's not something that's associated with biblical Christianity. Yeah, I, I know that I read MacArthur's position on this, and I understand what he's saying. I just wanted to insert at this moment a warning to our viewers about a so-called charismatic Christian apologist 
named Michael Brown. A major mark of the charismatic Pentecostal movement is a major lack of biblical discernment when it comes to biblical truth and doctrine. Much of the time, it is more of a matter of personal feelings and emotions rather than the truth of the Word of God, making the entire movement a dangerous haven for false prophets. As you can see here, this Michael Brown fellow tries to verify false prophets like Benny Hinn with his presence on their TV shows, although he doesn't say what they say specifically. His mere presence as a guest gives false prophets credibility. And Sid Roth with his check your mind at the door tactics and his delusional speaking in tongues nonsense. Hanging out with false prophets is a trait of this Michael Brown person. So beware of him. As the New American Standard says, do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Become sober-minded as you ought and stop sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. What you're seeing on your screen there, as you can see from the cut line under the photograph, is uh, five early Pentecostal leaders pictured at the Azusa Street Mission. In the front are the mission pastor, William J. Seymour and John G. Lake. Uh, standing are uh, Brother Adams, F.F. F. Boswell, and Tom Hesma Hollick. Uh, now, what's interesting here in the front, you've basically got uh, sitting down there in front, the African-American man there, William J. Seymour, he pretty much started it. He learned all his stuff, as we'll find out soon, from Charles Parham, who basically started the Pentecostal movement back in 1901. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Seymour learned from Parham, went to Azusa Street and started his own thing, which, uh, which interestingly enough, uh, William J. Seymour, the African-American man, kind of learned his stuff from Charles Parham, who is really the father of the Pentecostal charismatic movement. Uh, and so Seymour learns his stuff, and he goes off to another state, and he starts the Azusa Street Revival. And when they're over there jumping pews, and men and women are falling on each other and doing all the stuff charismatics do. You know, I guess howling like dogs and, mm. and barking like dogs or acting like animals or all the things that they do. Uh, well, Parham was totally offended by all that stuff and had a terrible break with, with, uh, with William J. Seymour. It's also interesting looking at this photograph. You've got uh, uh, John G. Lake uh, next to him. And what's interesting there is he, was, he had a police record. He... Uh, he, he was even arrested for impersonating a police officer. Mm. <laughs> and he even dressed up like a woman one time. It's mm. kind of interesting about these dudes, you know. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure there's other stories about all five of them. But uh, here's, here's some of your main leaders of the early Pentecostal charismatic movement yeah. seen for us here in this picture. Is that Joseph Smith and his divining rod in there? <laughs> no, no. They, well, they, they all have a screw loose somewhere. Uh, I mean, like a, yeah, like I, bizarre like, like I said before, uh, you know, when you study the origins and history and the teachings of the modern day Pentecostal, which comprise most of them, remember, we're not talking about continuationists. Right. That's why they came up with the name continuationists, right. so they wouldn't be associated. We're talking about real charismatics and Pentecostals, not the continuations. Right. Uh, so when we're dealing with charismatic and Pentecostals, you can basically deal with them the same way you deal with Mormons, as you just mentioned, Joseph Smith Jr. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a playlist on our YouTube channel on Mormonism. Check it out. You get into the history. We've got newsletters on them and everything else. We, the, 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 uh, having a screw loose uh, is one thing, but uh, you also have a... In, in, uh, uh, Joseph Smith Jr., a man who had a police record himself right, right. Uh, for fraudulent money, uh, uh, treasure uh, looking. And he, he would get people to pay him money to look through a, a, you know, one of these occultic uh, crystals or whatever and find hidden treasures. And yeah. then they filed on him when he took their money and didn't find them any hidden treasures. <laughs> 
uh, it just now, goes on and on. As you that get into could them. be a summary of the modern Pentecostal movement. Yes, you yes. Take your money, but no hidden treasures. That's right. No hidden treasures. No hidden treasures. Uh, you know, I think of Joseph, uh, the founder of uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, Charles Taz Russell. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know he divorced his wife, and uh, in the court records, which I just happen to have copies of, uh, of that divorce proceeding. Uh, he was messing around with an underage female, mm. and that's what caused his wife to to divorce him. And uh, when you find what's interesting, when you find what you find out about false prophets, is uh, and, and this is outlined in the Word of God, uh, they're usually interested in money, sex, and power. Power, yeah. Money, sex, and power. And when you start looking at these Pentecostal leaders and and preachers and everything else, over and over again, you find that reoccurring theme in all their lives, which we're going to see some here after a while. How does that uh, work out for our modern politicians? Well, I, you I know, but at least they're not I, claiming to be religious leaders. No, they're you know? not. They're but, just Pied Pipers. That's it. You got all. You got the same ingredients. Yeah. Well, that's exactly right. Once again, we'll go back to. Kurt Koch's book, Charismatic Gifts, for a conclusion on this matter. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 22 says, So then tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophecy is for a sign, not to unbelievers, but to those who believe. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 5 says, Greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Here's what Paul says about speaking in tongues. Number one, 1 Corinthians 14, 18 says, I speak with tongues more than ye all. Number two, 1 Corinthians 14, 39 Forbid not to speak with tongues, since the gift of tongues created much disorder and confusion in Corinth, the apostles set out rules for the use of the gift of tongues. And here are those rules for using the gift of tongues. Number one, 1 Corinthians 14, 19. Better five words with understanding than 10,000 in tongues. Number two. 1 Corinthians 14, 27. Only two or at most three to speak in tongues. Rule number three, verse 27. One at a time. Rule number four, verse 28. No speaking in tongues without an interpreter. Rule number five, verse 32. The gift of tongues must be subject to control. Number six, verse 33, speaking in tongues must not produce confusion. Rule number seven, verse 40, speaking in tongues must be done decently and in order. Rule number eight, verse 34, women must not speak in tongues publicly in church. Since this saying in verse 34 has been frequently misinterpreted, a brief explanation must be given. The New Testament gives some regulations with respect to women. The ministry of women is restricted. Number one, 1 Corinthians 14.34, women are not to speak in tongues in church. Rule number two, 1 Timothy chapter two, verses 12 and following. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. But women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Continuing reading from page 121 of Kurt Koch's book, The Tongues Movement Today. Although I support the biblical gift of tongues, I have said a firm no 
to the so-called tongues movement. Why? The eight points made by Paul in the epistle to the Corinthians are neither observed nor obeyed. Most of those who pray in tongues are women. No interpreter is present. There are sometimes 20 women or more. Occasionally, they even pray simultaneously. In the extremist groups, things are not done decently and in order. Finally, they turn the gift into a law and make it the criterion of baptism in the Spirit. In the tongues movement, the devil has succeeded in making giant inroads into the church of Jesus. My most recent example should be mentioned. It comes from Prince Edward Island, one of the eastern provinces of Canada. A devout pastor was holding a weekly prayer meeting. Present were the pastor, his wife, and some believers belonging to the congregation. In the midst of the prayer meeting, the wife suddenly began to pray in tongues. The pastor was horrified. This was the first time it had happened in his congregation. Hardly had she finished when another woman who was a believer began to speak in tongues. There was no interpreter. The pastor felt uneasy. He broke off the prayer meeting and sent the members home. As I see it, the wife has allowed herself to be tainted. She owns a large number of fetishes, idols, devil masks, and all kinds of cultic objects from the mission field. She thinks of herself as a collector of harmless objects, not realizing that a person can be tainted by cultic objects that have served for devil worship. Other Christians have the same impression. They too think this woman is tainted. It is a common experience for people to speak in tongues in the vicinity of an occult taint or mediumistic capabilities or even the train of spiritualism. Meanwhile, this eruption of tongues in the prayer meeting ended in tragedy. The pastor's wife and the second woman who spoke in tongues both lost their minds and are in a mental hospital. To the gifts of the Holy Spirit, an unqualified yes. The prophecy concerning the eschaton, second coming, of the Lord, etc., is finished with the canon collection of the New Testament. Some other gifts play an important role only for a limited period without having totally ceased, while others will continue to be relevant until the return of Jesus. To all gifts that are the product of demonic inspiration or even of human aping, a radical, a firm no. Finally, let me give some remarks concerning tongues. Number one, the epistle of the Corinthians was written in the spring of 57 AD. The later epistles of the apostles do not have the problem of tongues. We see by this fact that the tongues were already diminishing. Number two, the Corinthian congregation was the most troublesome and carnal congregation of the Apostle Paul. In the mature congregations, there were no problem of tongues. Number three, for centuries of church history, there was no strife of tongues. Number four, whoever makes a law out of tongues is a heretic. Number five, the Bible contains all we need for our salvation. Number six, it would be a blessing and a gift of the Holy Spirit if our own tongue would be liberated from all evil speaking and sanctified for the adoration of God. As we get ready to sign off, I would recommend to our viewers the following books. Strange Fire by John MacArthur. The Danger of Offending the Holy Spirit with Counterfeit Worship. Wandering Stars, Contending for the Faith with the New Apostles and Prophets by Keith Gibson, forward by Craig Branch. The Confusing World of Benny Hinn, a call for discerning the ministry and teaching of the popular healing evangelist by G. Richard Fisher and M. Kurt Gudelman. 
a different gospel, a historical and biblical analysis of the modern faith movement by D.R. McConnell. This last book is out of print, but you should still be able to get it through Amazon.com, hopefully. It's called The Agony of Deceit, What Some TV Preachers Are Really Teaching. Michael Horton, editor, contributors, R.C. Sproul, C. Everett Koop, Joel Niederhood, Walter Martin is a contributor of this book and others. In fact, we have a video series that our ministry, Christian Answers, has produced based off of this book with Michael Horton as our guest. Check it out on our Phony TV Preachers playlist on our main YouTube channel, See Answers TV. We're going to sign off for now. I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, tune, us in, tune in again next time for the next episode in this series. Uh, I'm Larry Wessels with Christian Answers. Rob Zins with a Christian witness to Roman Catholicism. I got it right. Yeah? Very and, good. And uh, just remember this. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. That's John 14, 6. And you only find a Jesus like that in the Word of God. Don't trust in these TV preachers or a charismatic feeling or, or speaking in tongues. Or Trust the Word of God alone. Trust Christ alone in the Word of God alone, and you'll have the right Jesus. All right, with that, God bless you all. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Hello, this is Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian Debater. And I'd like to let you know that free newsletters are available from our ministry. Just email us at cdebater at aol.com and give us your mailing address and we'll mail them out to you for free. You can also call us at 512-218-8022 and leave your address there. You can also access all our newsletters online by going to one of our three websites called BibleQuery.org. Once on the homepage, simply click on the Experience box and then scroll down to the newsletter section as shown here. Since our number one most watched video of the over 548 videos we have produced for YouTube at the time of this recording is... Unpopular Bible Doctrines, number one, The Biblical God No One Wants to Know, with over 433,000 viewings. Our latest newsletter is called Unpopular Topic, How Sovereign is God? Our second most viewed YouTube video is Six-Year-Old Wife of Muhammad Was Okay by the Muslim God Allah, But Not by the Biblical God of Jesus with over 341,000 viewings. We also have three newsletters available on Islam. Our video, Debate, Larry Wessels versus Two Jehovah's Witnesses at a University Study Center, currently has close to 150,000 views. See our newsletter on the Jehovah's Witnesses. Jehovah's Witnesses, Deceive Deceivers. Our video, Is Jesus God Almighty in the Flesh, Meaning the Second Person of the Trinity, or Is He Something Else, has over 101,000 viewings. See our newsletter, Testimony to the Eternal Godhead, the Trinity. Our video, Biography, the famous 19th century Prince of Preachers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, a man of God, has close to 89,000 views. See two of our newsletters with lead articles from sermons by Spurgeon. Our video, UFOs, 
Ancient aliens or beings of the fourth dimension. Number one, fact or fiction, has over 207,000 viewings. Not only do UFOs and the occult use the same disciplines, such as levitation, teleportation of objects, psychokinesis, clairvoyance, automatic writing, and telepathy, but their theologies are completely foreign to biblical Christianity. UFO theologies include everything from reincarnation and evolution to man achieving cosmic godhood, but they do not include Jesus Christ as the only mediator between God and man, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. We have two newsletters related to the world of the occult to which UFOs are a part. Our video, Former Roman Catholic Bride of Christ, Nun Testifies of Abnormal Life in the Convent, has over 67,000 viewings. Our video featuring former Roman Catholic Rob Zins, who has a Master of Theology from Dallas Theological Seminary, historical split between Roman Catholicism and the Christ of the Scripture, man's word or God's word, has over 53,000 viewings. See our two newsletters on the subject of Roman Catholicism. Our video, Cult of Ellen G. White, number one, Beginnings of the 19th Century Religion, called Seventh-day Adventism, has over 48,000 viewings and features former Seventh-day Adventist Wallace Slattery, who has 44 years' experience with this religion. Our playlist, called Dealing with Seventh-day Adventism and Their Prophetess, features 15 videos with 14 hours of material. See our newsletter, Seventh-day Adventism, True or False. For theological music lovers, see our video, Favorite Old-Time Christian Bluegrass Gospel Music, Psalm 98, verses 4 and 5. With over 214,000 viewings, we have also posted several music videos by my own daughter, Marlena Wessels, from her CD, Win This Fight, songs she has written and performed herself. To see our music videos, please go to our main YouTube channel page, scroll down to our multiple playlists, arrow over to our playlist called our radio shows with national Christian authors and music vids. Once there, scroll down to the bottom of the playlist where the music videos are listed. I could go on and on, but this should be sufficient for now. Don't forget to check out our main YouTube channel, C Answers TV, which stands for Christian Answers Television, also which has over 19 playlists by topic as you scroll down our channel page.